I am Corey Andrew Powell, and I'm joined today by May Lee, a broadcast journalist and host for over 30 years, both a U.S.-based and international anchor, correspondent, and producer. Most recently, May partnered with Next Shark, the leading Asian online news source, where she launched The May Lee Show, a podcast video talk show focused on Asian American issues and stories. May, welcome to Motivational Mondays. Oh, thank you so much, Corey. It's a pleasure being here. I look forward to the conversation. Oh, yes. Well, I'm happy you're here too. And um, to begin, though, a couple of things I want to just clarify for our listeners, your particular ethnic background, you are Korean. Right? Correct. Correct. Okay. I am um, Korean American. My parents immigrated to this country. I was born here, but then we actually moved back to Korea for a couple of years when I was very, very young. Oh, wow. Okay. And then I know um, just also with today's landscape of so many ethnicities, we have all these different acronyms. Like I literally just learned what like, you know, bio POC was or something. I'm a black man. So, AA, <laughs> so <laughs> AAPI is specifically Asian American Pacific Islander. That's correct. Okay. But we'll here's the thing, that. Corey, that keeps mm -hmm. changing too. Oh, gosh. so to keep up, even <laughs> I can barely keep up honestly. And so, and I have to keep up, but yeah, you now hear things like a PISA, a PIFA, you know, because they're trying to include other Asians as well, because when you mm -hmm. say Asian, most people it's think large, East Asian, right? right so right. Japan, China, Korea, and you're foregoing and you're kind of, oh, the, the South Asians are being overshadowed like mm -hmm. Indians, right? Exactly. Uh, so a pizza includes South Asians as well. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. It's hard. But, it's hard. You know, and, and it's doubly difficult for me because I'm also a member of the what used to be the LGBT community. Yeah. And now that is LBGTQ plus IA. And if they just keep going with that, I'm not sure. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to remember it all, but I'm going to try and keep it all together. Yeah. So, well, thank you for that clarity. I appreciate it. Um, but before we get into the, the the discussion about race and ethnicity that we're both so passionate about, I do want to talk about you have a book, though. Yeah. And your book is uh, May Lee Live and uh, Live, live and in May Person. May Lee Live and in Person. Thank yeah. you. It all begins with passion. Yes. That's the full title of your book. So share with me and uh, our listeners why you wrote the book and what's it all about? Well, honestly, Corey, I didn't choose to write the book. A publisher had come to me when I was still living in Singapore. And that's when I was about to launch my first iteration of the May Lee show. And that was a talk show um, about the empowering woman of Asia. Because when I was living in Asia at the time, and this was like 2007, 2008, I saw this change that was very dynamic change that was happening with women in Asia, where they were becoming more independent, more vocal, more career oriented, you know? And so I was like, wow, there needs to be a show about this. Kind of like Oprah-esque, right? But, you know, yeah. and Oprah is my hero, of course, who, you know, who doesn't I mean, look at Oprah as her hero, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. I have, we have a similar hero. Yeah, so. exactly. So, um, so because I was doing this and I was embarking on something really, really new, as a journalist um, and something that Asia had never seen before. A publisher came to me and asked me, would you be willing to write a book about your career up to now as a journalist, as an Asian woman, you know, kind of fighting through a difficult um, career and in industry mm -hmm. where they knew there was a lot of sexism and racism and things like that. So that's why I wrote the book. I was not planning on writing a sort of an autobiography at that point in my life, but uh, they wanted to kind of tell the story of how I built, you know, my career, but then embarked on this new adventure. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And I yeah. also, you know what, honestly, Corey, let me just jump in. I also okay. wanted to share, you know, kind of very honestly um, that things aren't easy, you know, especially for people of color and women, you know, who are women of color, especially. So right. I wanted to try to empower um, people through my story, you know, mm -hmm. be honest. Yeah. Well, that's really important, especially now when there's so many efforts in America, it seems, and, and, and foolishly so, yeah. to sort of like suppress the actual truth of this country's history and how we interact with other races and, um, you know, things that we quite frankly did to other ethnicities. Yes. Specifically, I always think about, you don't have to be of a certain ethnicity to understand the atrocities that that group has gone through. And so one of the most disturbing things for me in this country um, is the Japanese internment camp. Time yes. Yes. During World War II. And 
I find that fascinating because that's something that's always just stuck with me. But then I did watch some of your, your talks on YouTube, your videos, mm -hmm. and I saw you came across this wonderful quote and I'm going to make sure I have the name correct. Hopefully the name correct. Mitsuye Yamada. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, she has this great quote, which is to finally recognize our own visibility is to finally be on the path toward visibility. Invisibility is not a natural state for anyone. And I know that struck a chord with you because I watched you discuss it. And she happens to be someone who was impacted by the Japanese internment camp. That's right. Matter during yep. World War II. So talk a little bit about what that quote meant for you when you read it. It really struck a chord, and I'm really glad you're bringing that up because I think we all struggle, so many of us struggle with invisibility in different ways, right? Um, and you and I, of course, know this as people of color. And this country has a long history of invisibilizing certain groups of people. And so we oppress those feelings. And, well, no, we are oppressed and we repress those feelings because we kind of feel like that's the standard that we have to follow. And so when I saw this quote, it's like, yeah, invisibility is not a natural state for anyone. We're all human beings. Uh, we all have something to say and do. We have a purpose. But when that's blocked by um, controlling power, Right. Um, and obviously we know that white supremacy has been sort of a plague in this country for centuries. Um, we need to finally speak up and push back on that and be heard uh, and be recognized for who we are um, as different as we are. And isn't that the beauty of humanity? Right. I mean, who wants the same of anything? Right. Is that just like having the same meal every day? Right, so, right. you know, so we have to really break down that idea of invisibilization of, you know, communities and people um, and really start learning from each other. And like you said, I love the fact that, Corey, that, you know, you know about the J Japanese in internment. Now we call it Japanese incarceration mm -hmm. because that's a much stronger way of yeah. talking about what really happened. Because these people, you know, 120,000 Japanese, Japanese Americans were incarcerated for years uh, when they were totally innocent, completely had nothing to do with what happened you know, in Pearl Harbor and during the war. Yeah. So when we start educating each other and when we start learning about this history um, and, and not like covering it up and pretending like it didn't happen, then we develop more awareness. Then we develop empathy you know, for another community that you might not be part of, but like you said, at least having that awareness under and understanding helps you build that awareness and helps bridge those gaps and build builds that sense of community and solidarity. That's what we need to do. I so agree with that, which is part of why the whole idea of fighting against this theory of critical critical race theory for uh, the African American studies, this sort of like kind of boogeyman assessment of that whole thing is so strange because all we are saying is we just want the modern day American to understand the previous, the previous days of America so we can understand how we got here and then move forward harmoniously. You would think that today's people would want their kids to, to know that so we can maybe move beyond it. And it's so strange that it's the exact opposite. <laughs> it's like, it, isn't it, Corey? I mean, here's the thing. It's like, we're talking about history. We're talking about things that right. actually happened. Like there are receipts for this. Yeah, right? there, exactly. <laughs> this is not some fantasy or fiction that was created. This actually happened. Therefore, right. that's why people who learn about this in school, they learn about slavery, they learn about what happened to African-Americans. And so therefore there is a level of understanding and awareness, right, today about that. So yeah. I use that as a parallel, actually, as a very good example of slavery, um, the Holocaust, what happened to mm -hmm. the Jews. That's taught in schools. That is talked about in the media, in movies. It's depicted, right, because it actually happened. So therefore, because of that, there's a better understanding and level of awareness. Same thing with Asian American history. Because that's not taught in schools, there's not that level of understanding. Now, if they're trying to wipe out critical race theory in schools, you know, when things like that, you know, we all recognize, then we're in big trouble. I mean, I just read like yesterday, a certain governor of a certain state threw out math books, apparently, because the math books 
Oh, I did see that. I mean, it's how does a math? It's math. (laughs) Teach race. I don't know how they sort of what algebra got them to that equation, but yeah, um, yeah, it is kind of scary. And um, but when you speak specifically too about the understanding the other people that we don't maybe look like or share ethnicity with, you do specifically talk often about the stereotypes of Asian women in our society. And of course, they're there for men too, but specifically for you, you're impacted by the stereotypes for for women. Among them would be that um, the Asian, well, particularly, I guess, in your particular ethnic group of of Asia, uh, the women are weak or demure submissive uh, submissive yeah right. exactly and you're like you're like no ma'am we, <laughs> there's so much more happening so i yeah. would love for you to talk a little bit about like that stereotype and where do you think that originates from or is it just perpetuated by media as most things are well um, that for sure and actually i started uh, i developed this new course at uh, usc annenberg where i'm an adjunct professor um, just this past fall that is uh, the evolution of Asian Americans in the media because I wanted to teach why these narratives and these stereotypes exist because Mm -hmm. of historical events and the media and journalism and movies and things like that that perpetuated all of these stereotypes. So it comes from that for sure. But where did it come from? This stereotype of the submissive, weak, hypersexualized Asian woman comes from hundreds of years ago when, you know, Asian women were first coming here and so they were used as prostitutes, as sex, sex slaves and things like that. So that stereotype started then. But then mm. the media, movies, things like that picked up on that idea of yeah. either the Asian woman is the butterfly who needs to be saved, but then she always dies at the end because she commits suicide mm. because she, her white savior didn't come back. Right? Never that's, showed up, right? Yeah, exactly. That's that's Madame Butterfly, right? The famous opera, that story. Mm-hmm. And then Miss Saigon later on Broadway. Mm. or dragon lady so that's the really vicious kind of mysterious woman who tries to steal your man you know and will do whatever it takes so those are all very negative stereotypes that to this day exist right Mm -hmm. in sort of war vietnam war movies right full metal jacket um popularized that horrible line me love you long time Yeah, yeah you can ask every asian woman have they ever heard that from somebody? And we will all say, oh God, give me a dollar for every time I've heard that. Mm. So things like that, you know, if we don't try to dismantle all of these stereotypes um, slowly but surely, then, you know, we're not gonna get very far. The Atlanta shooting a year ago at the Asian spas, that was textbook example of how those hypersexualized stereotypes of Asian women still exist. Right. Mm-hmm. Those women were all dismissed yeah. as sex workers when they were not. Yeah. And there was so much sadly going on with the actual shooter in that case. This whole psychological yeah. thing where his assessment of what someone else was is what prevailed his actions and thoughts and made him take on such horrible actions. That's right. And I love that you bring up that weird line from, well, it was just, I think, meant to be an innocuous line in that film. But of course, it yeah. goes on because it got immortalized in a rap song. And yeah. it, and I had not even really thought about until you just said that, how if I were an Asian woman, how offensive that would be to have to hear it now part of like this American vernacular and pop music, mind you, that radio will play a hit song 20 yes. to 100 times in, in, in one hour, right? Yeah. And sometimes. So, wow, I didn't even think about that's, you know, how you put yourself in someone else's shoes to right. try to understand. And look, Corey, I mean, I don't expect you or other people to get that until it's told in a different way, like I just presented it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why talking about these things openly, like we are today, and trying to educate each other and hearing each other, right? Mm -hmm. Listen to each other. And then that just snaps. And then you're like, oh, wow, I never even thought of it that way. But Mm -hmm. now you're going to think differently about that line, right? And luckily, I thought the song was gross anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I didn't really like it to begin with, but I heard it enough, right? I was like, are they serious with this? So yeah. I totally get it. And I think um, I'm very lucky in a way too that I live in Jersey City, New Jersey, and we're like a, you know, almost like a, a little mini New York. Yeah. And we're right across the, the, the Hudson River. I'm yep. 10 minutes from Manhattan. But in the particular building where my partner and I bought our place um, in 2007, uh, when we began to meet our other neighbors and condo owners here, um, 
it was like a rainbow of ethnicities. Um, and so my closest friends here in the building became um, a really interesting family that they were Koreans ah. and the daughter was Korean and she had a black boyfriend who is now her, um, she's got two children with him and they moved to Tennessee. And I thought, well, that's a, that's a interesting choice for a Korean. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> with black mixed kids. But um, what I thought was fascinating was now through Michelle, who's the daughter's eyes, who has these two children with a black man in Tennessee, she even sees this whole other level, yeah. right? Because now her children are almost like kind of double marginalized yes. in a society that's racist. Right. So when she and I talk about that, she was like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe. And, and it scares her, right? Because she has visibly different children in one of the most difficult states to have visibly different looking children. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but she does talk about how she's, her, her eyes are opened a lot more than they were, even just what she, what she experienced as a Korean. Now with brown children, it's yeah. even more intensified. Oh yeah. To see it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, I grew up in Ohio in the 1970s. So that was a interesting experience for someone who looked different. Right. And who was always considered the other. Um, right. and marginalized. So, mm. you know, that kind of experience of having biracial children and then two races that are considered minorities and, you know, the other, that's got to yeah. be even a greater challenge. And then living in, a, in an environment that, you know, doesn't accept anything, but, you know, the standard. Yeah. Yeah. I keep telling her, come on back to the North. I know. <laughs> I, gosh. I know. You know, but here's the thing, Corey, what, the sad thing about what's been happening over the last two and a half years, and this is why I've become so active and vocal about what's, you know, about Asian American history and activism and things like that is because of course, all the anti-Asian hate. And we have been experiencing this, you know, full force and it hasn't stopped. Um, mm. You know, I know the media has moved on. But it is a scary thing because it's not just happening in these random, you know, places where you think racism definitely exists. It's happening right. in the big, it's happening in New York and San Francisco and LA and Chicago. It's happening across the country. Mm -hmm. And so there is a level, a new level of fear that people are suffering from yeah. now uh, that we didn't have as much of before. Uh, there's always this underlying racism, of course, you know, that you had to be aware of, but COVID and xenophobia and the anti-Asian hate has definitely opened up a terrible can of worms. So it's yeah. been a, it's been a tough time. And you've also notably mentioned that the recipients, like on the receiving end of a lot of this anti-Asian violence, yeah, uh, it's women, which I was, yeah. I mean, I had no idea. 67%. That so that's 67%. Yeah. Are, are women um, who are, either, you know, attacked physically, verbally, harassed. Um, so yes, because going back again, Corey, why? Because of the stereotype. Mm -hmm. Because Asian women are seen as the weakest, the most vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore easiest targets. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny we talk about stereotypes and specifically, I guess we were saying about women, but I have this thought too of something else that was so disturbing to me as a non-Asian person, but when I saw it and it's, uh, you know, I'm really big into films and, and media and classic Hollywood movies. And, you know, I had years ago not seen Breakfast at Tiffany's, which meant like, oh, I'm going to take my, take my gay card away if I had not. Watched it. So <laughs> I had to finally sit down and watch this movie because I do love Audrey. I could not believe the Mickey Rooney character when he Mr. came to the yeah, it was so egregious that I, I actually remember reaching out to my friend Billy Lou, who's Chinese American. I was like, I'm sorry, but can I, <laughs> how, how did you guys react to this? Because I am livid, and it's like 50 years ago yeah. <laughs> when this movie was made. And it, yeah, that was a problematic character. But what I do love about it is Mickey Rooney himself, later, years later, yeah, said that out of his career, that is the the most the most regrettable thing he's ever done in yeah. his life not just in films just you know understanding why that was so problematic right. and i love that he at least had that awakening but that was a horrible stereotype oh my so. gosh i mean i use that example in my classes all the time and oh, and, and, really? and oh yeah 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 when i talk about different media stereotypes that were you know how this you know media perpetuated these stereotypes his yeah. character is one of the worst of all time it's hard. It's because, first of all, it's, um, you know, it's whitewashing, right? It's the mm -hmm. it's white face, right? Taking yeah. taking an ethnic right, character right. and then using a white person, 
right. right. They could have found an actual guy. They wanted that. They no, found a no. guy like that. In Hollywood, <laughs> you know, it was a is a what well, was a white person's, you know, world back then. Yeah. So all characters were had to be played by white actors oftentimes. Right. And so his character is just um, you know, it's beyond a caricature, right? Beyond mm -hmm. offensive. But here's the sad thing, Corey. When we all were growing up and watching this movie, even as Asians, right, back then, we kind of didn't even question it. Why? Mm. Because we were all programmed to think it was okay. That yeah. it was okay for this guy to make fun of Asians and look ridiculous and act all goofy because we were programmed by the controlling majority to think that, no, you know, we can, we can make fun of this. Mm. And so we kind of just, you know, sucked it up and said, okay, fine. Of course, then you realize, oh my God, this is horrific. Now, even someone like you, right? Now you see, you're like, whoa, right? Yeah, I could, can't even. Right. That, to me, is success to a certain extent that we have at least made progress where people are like, oh, God, okay, mm -hmm. we can't do that. However, mm -hmm. we're still seeing it in the media. We're still seeing it in films where people who are supposed to be Asian or Black even or Latin, Latinx, they're still being played by people who really aren't. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. still that sort of whitewashing that's taking place in Hollywood. Scarlett Johansson played an anime character in yeah. Ghost in the Shell. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think Tom Cruise did the whole like Last Samurai or last something. Last Samurai. Like right. Right. He, a like, white guy is supposed to be the Last Samurai. OK, that's interesting. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Tilda Swinton, she played the one in um, one of the Marvel movies. Uh, mm -hmm. Originally, that's supposed to be an old like Buddhist and uh, monk. Uh, so why did they choose like oh, right. the, one of the whitest women in Hollywood to play that character? Yeah, like that is a strange. I didn't realize that the actual character. Cause I'm, I don't follow the whole comic book world, but I know the exact character. They yeah. kind of did her up like a yeah, yeah, like a, a, a like Manchu a, and well, she uh, didn't yeah. have a Fu Manchu, but she was bald and you know she was supposed to right, be like this Tibetan or something. Tib exactly, exactly. Right. You know, Emma Stone. She was supposed to be half Asian in um, Aloha. The movie, her, she was supposed to be Hawaiian. Emma Stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's still happening. It's still happening. But we're at least becoming a little bit more aware, a little bit more sensitive to the fact that, okay, you know what, maybe we need to get this right. Wonderful. Well, May Lee, thank you so much for your time today. And again, for sharing your story and kind of helping us move forward in this sort of landscape and of, of, of minefields, if you will, of like just, you know, race and ethnicity. It's a little tricky out there. So I think conversations like this really do help and can help guide people to a more synonymous existence. So thank you. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me on and allowing me to talk about this, because I think these conversations are really important and they can be impactful. Even if one person is changed by it, then we've done our job.